The Legend of Korra is the sequel to Avatar The Last Airbender. Now most people hate Korra because they say the show has bad writing or that the characters aren't as good as the ones in Avatar. And some of those points are somewhat true, but there are also falls in some areas. Like when it comes to bad writing, honestly, I don't really see it anywhere except for pretty much the entirety of Book 2 as well as some of the romance stuff between Korra, Asami, and Mako in Books 1 and 2. But there's a genuine excuse for Book 2 being bad that isn't necessarily the writer's fault. And that's that they only had plans to do one season, but Nickelodeon made them do more seasons and they weren't prepared for the second one, so it ended up being horrible. But books 3 and 4 are honestly some of the best of Korra, so that's why I'm stating this as an explanation. Just so you know that the writers aren't entirely at fault for book 2 being horrible. The horrible romance stuff though, can absolutely be blamed on them. Every time I watch the first two books, when there's interactions that involve some level of romance, I just have to skip it because it's actual cringe and I just can't. The character development in Korra is definitely lackluster, especially when you look at the amazing characters of Avatar and how they grow, change, and develop over time. But in Korra, the only two of the main cast of characters who have any real development are Korra and Asami. Korra's development is pretty obvious because in each book she gets beaten down by her enemies and she learns a valuable lesson from all of them that helps her grow into a stronger, better person. Like how after book 3 when she was poisoned, she not only had to overcome her physical disabilities, but also her mental ones. She even has to confront and talk to Zaheer in order to finally reconnect with her avatar spirit and go back to the spirit world. But like I said, Korra wasn't the only one in the main cast to get some level of character development. Asami also changed a little bit, a lot less than Korra, but she still changed a little. Her development mostly comes from her feelings towards her father, because in book 1, he was one of the main antagonists of the story, and she grew to hate him because of that, but as time went on, as we see in book 4, she started to miss her father and started to forgive him for his actions, and he also redeems himself by sacrificing his life in the final battle of the series. The setting of Korra isn't as good as Avatar, because Avatar was the original series, so it did all of the world building, but also because most of Korra happens in the same place, which is Republic City. It's a cool and diverse place, but Aang and his gang traveled all across the world and saw all different kinds of people and places. And the first time we see anything outside of Republic City that isn't Korra's house is in Book 2, when they're walking around the festival and they don't stay long enough for anything to happen, and the writing wasn't up to par enough for you to care about. They also go to see the air temples, and we actually do see some cool stuff there. Book 3 is when they really get diverse, and we actually see them traveling across the Earth Kingdom, and we see the new Ba Sing Se and a few other towns during Korra's era, and we go back to the air temples, and we actually learn a lot about airbender culture, and what really expands upon stuff that we didn't know about before. They also visit a new city called Zaofu, which is cool to see because this city is a product of its time they live in, because in Aang's time, Zaofu would have never existed, so it was cool to see a city like that. The soundtrack in Korra is amazing. Not quite as good as the one in Avatar, but there are definitely some amazing songs that play throughout the series, and one that I think is actually better in Korra versus Avatar is the Avatar theme itself, when they go into the Avatar state. I think Korra's version is far better than Avatar's version. They're both amazing, but I think the different, almost safer tone of Korra's Avatar theme is just way better than the one in Avatar. That's not the only track from Korra that's amazing though. They're all good, and I feel like the subtle things like this get overshadowed when people are talking about Korra, because I've never heard someone mention the soundtrack and how good it is because people only want to talk about the negative and almost never the positive. The villains in Korra are honestly pretty good. The only one that I don't like is Unalak, because unlike the other three main villains, he's just evil for the sake of being evil. And sure, you could argue that maybe he wanted to bring the spirits back or whatever, but I just don't think that was his motivation, especially once we learn more about his past and realize that he only really cares about getting more power, which instantly makes him a bad villain in my eyes because he doesn't have any real motivation and he's just evil for the sake of being evil. Amon is an amazing villain. His presence alone is terrifying with that mask of his, but he's also got a very good reason for wanting equality for the entire world, especially if we look at his past and see who his father was. All of those past experiences turned him into the guy who wanted to change the world and make sure that no one was oppressed anymore, but he was way too extreme in his views. But can we all just say that when we learned that he could take people's bending away, it was terrifying? He definitely wins the most terrifying villain front for sure. Zaheer is an interesting villain because he's all about anarchy and wanting the world to be free of world leaders. I like Zaheer a lot because of his knowledge of the Air Nation despite not being from the Air Nation, and when he gets airbending he's already a master because of all of his studying from before. Zaheer is probably the strongest person Korra fought in the series, especially since he had to fight him while being poisoned and he's a good villain to come straight after Unalak because of his great connection to the spirit world and the fact that he actually helps Korra enter the spirit world again after she was poisoned. Kuvira is an interesting villain. We first see her in book 3 when she saved Korra's father from falling off that cliff. She was introduced as a nice person and even in book 4 we can kind of see that she's really only doing these things because she loves her country and her people. But the problem is that she became an evil dictator and even threw foreigners in prison camps. Although in the comics she later explained that she had no idea what really went on in those camps that shows a level of negligence on her part because she should have known what was going on in those camps. 
although there is some good that she did, like reunifying the Earth Kingdom, and there was also a huge advancement in technology under her watch as well, so there's definitely some good that happened under her watch. And out of all the villains, I'd say that she was the least evil. She was more misguided than evil, and she really wanted to save the Earth Kingdom and thought she could do a better job than the king, so she took the initiative and did it, but she took it way too far by trying to also take over Republic City. The Legend of Korra isn't as good as Avatar, but it's still an enjoyable series to watch, and I really like it. But I do understand where a lot of Avatar fans come from with their criticisms, but most of the issues with Korra happen in Book 2, whereas the rest of the series is actually pretty good. I love the fights, and the fact that the Air Nation came back, and the spirit stuff was kinda cool overall. The series is pretty good, and I think that you should definitely give it a watch because it's very enjoyable. 